Hello everybody and thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino and I am inviting you to something of a wild, a ride, to an accessible introduction to common Lisp and functional programming by Shinnosuke Yamada, a Lisp book in electronic form, which I got on Amazon just a couple of years back for the amazing price of three euro and as I notice it hasn't changed price like in the last seven years so what is the special thing about this it's actually quite thorough with regard to the examples it gives and combinations of features which you cannot really find quite in that fashion in any other book and at the same time it actually quite omits in-depth explanations and and some material you would normally expect to see in a Lisp book for instance the comparisons between the dif different equality operators but nonetheless exactly because of the examples and the place and uh, ideas the author presents the book clearly is worth it and i have made a couple of screenshots where i wanted to show you through a couple of interesting aspects so without further ado let's just jump into it but don't be surprised if what you see is not quite the traditional way that lisp books are presenting material so it is certainly someone with dreams and a proper idea on what hacking is <laughs> that is to to find interesting solutions and not merely the security orientation which hacking nowadays seems to have gained and with that, we jump straight into our material and this is how the style of the book is going to be entirely. Most of elementary functions are already there as built-in functions. Plop! <laughs> no, it's not most of elementary functions. These are just a couple of numeric functions. You can have functions on symbols, on lists, on functions indeed so that is perchance not the clearest way to express it but looking at the examples one has to say one gets an idea of how this is working very nicely so with that the author already jumps into also showing you how the printing is working and seems to have a particular proclivity to use prink and terpri <laughs> but again here you do get an idea of how the printing operators are working in, in uh, detail if you look on the lower half of the page where one and then two and three are printed then the author is presenting truth values and functions which return a truth value are called indeed predicates shown are a lot of numeric examples although of course there are predicates of all sorts of nature and then you are being shown how to use predicates in conditions first the if condition is shown and not long afterwards the author is also presenting the cond condition type so in and in particular here interesting to note that any clause in cond can contain several consecutive statements that is contain a sort of implied progn if you so will so this is really nicely presented and normally i don't see this presentation of cond in other books normally it is just you know condition result condition result not such a multi-step consequence to any condition being triggered then we are straight jumping towards defining functions and there you are already getting a couple of ideas of how this might be done so <laughs> you realize enough variation is being presented in order to get used to how this is working and again he's showing you that define can contain more than one expression and while that is correct it is not something which most list books are showing. They are just showing you a definition and then, you know, there's just normally one parenthesed expression. 
Then he's calling functions through through the function keyword. Fun thing is he really does use fun call. Uh, no, he really does use uh, function. He, he does not use the the hash sign single quote example. He he really calls it that way. But the examples again are actually interesting. Like when you look at this f37 function he has and then how he is calling it and the various results which are then presented that is nice to note like you realize this is not going to serve as a great introduction for someone who has never touched lisp but certainly it is going to be enlightening if you already do know some Lisp and want to see how can you be pressing these buttons, how can you be putting things together so they deliver more interesting results, just as he's presenting here how a function itself can be the result of um, a function definition. Like, like, okay, I didn't put that very well, but that, that it can deliver a function to be applied on something. So, yeah, that, that is really an interesting idea, like this first one, f of x, to return plus or, or times. And then in a quite natural way, he is also going towards lambda. Then we are learning how you can get the, uh, how you can be setting symbols to values. The interesting thing is here, that is perhaps the old fashioned way to do that. Nowadays, you should actually somehow define that symbol either through a global def var definition or through a let. You shouldn't be just um, set queuing it. He's also showing that symbols can contain all sorts of characters. And <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the examples again speak for themselves. Now, he is also mentioning quote, but as you see, you better should know what quote means, because with quote, it is not evaluated and therefore can be used as a token, is not something which would be clear to the novice, right? So it's better, um, <laughs> so it is better to um, already know this before you jump towards this book, but you do not need to know it very well. You can actually get along quite nicely with this. And the examples I think are well selected. What is fun here is this use of symbols as keys. That's correct. Uh, it's completely fine to do that. But you know, other books normally would be talking of A lists and P lists and whatnot, and not just show you a sort of, if you will, disrespectful throwing aside of all traditional constructs and just simply going towards using the case statement in order to implement dictionaries. Although, in, indeed, there's nothing wrong with doing so. Now, he actually shows you uh, the uh, questions on scope with very nice examples. You see here this printing of A in the lower example or, or this... Um, like this sum of a in the in the upper example is showing you nicely how tighter bindings further in are overshadowing bindings which are happening further outward and and thus a very nice combination uh, of examples to show you lexical as opposed to dynamic scoping so that that is actually nice <laughs> and here you are seeing how yeah, he, he mentions set Q changes a local variable if it is there. Where? <laughs> of course, uh, the idea is defined previously locally. Uh, and here he does mention that global variables can be referred from anywhere unless they are not masked by a local scope. The idea being that a local A would of course shadow a global A. But you see, this is just too concise for someone who is not yet quite aware of Lisp. Here also, he has a weird thing where he is showing you this weird construct here as a list. Now, while it is a sort of list, 
it is not what one would normally understand as a proper list. It does not end with nil. And most list functions you're commonly used to wouldn't be working on such lists. Therefore, it is a little bit strange to start demonstrations of lists with that. And of course, he does play a little bit on the uh, boxes and arrows game. But, you know, that is sort of a tradition for all list books. Now here, you are seeing a function list that is creating proper lists. And the examples with the extremist, the Charlotte Fortran extremist and the Rosemary Haskell extremist uh, are indeed nice ways to show you, uh, you know, to see how things which are quoted are, you know, not having any symbol value attributed to them, whereas human and language do get the value which is defined in the function when it is being called. So again, the examples are not bad. Then you're also learning about this weird list star predicate. And I'm not sure many people have encountered it in everyday life. But indeed, yes, you can use it to create lists. And if you're looking in particular at the second example, you can even use it to create proper lists. It's just utterly strange. And it follows this Lisp tradition of naming stuff with an asterisk in order to signify it's sort of like the main thing, but not the main thing at some sort of variation of it. Now, then you're seeing also a little bit of these games of so first, second, and so on. What is funny here is that the function rest returns the CDR part of a list. You know, when people are teaching you about first and rest and, and things like that, they normally do that in a, you know, futile effort of bringing you away, of luring you away from using car and cutter. But to say that rest is like CDR sort of defeats the point of talking about rest in the first place. Nonetheless, uh, <laughs> you know, the information is there, just like here you're having equal compares to arguments. Well, given that you're having the choice between the equal sign, between string equal comparisons, between ek, ekel, equal, and equal p. To just pick equal and declare that it compares to arguments is a brave choice. And you do not have anything here, anywhere close in the book, where um, anything else would be demonstrated of, of these other quality operators. It's just like, this is equal, get used to it. <laughs> It is perhaps sound advice, like in, in my view, equal P even, or equal at least, should have been the default equality operators. What is a bit dangerous to that approach, to just present these, you know, like starting with these is fine, but to just present these, is that a lot of functions don't actually use them. Like for instance, member, the default test is not equal. You can define a test as equal, but normally a member function would test with equal, not with equal. So when you are introducing equal and, and somebody not so acquainted with Lisp uses it and gets weird results, they might not just realize that they are not using the correct equality operator. Then here you are seeing something uh, juxtaposed, which is a bit rare, but very useful. Namely, that type P is a predicate which ch checks for a number's type, but type off is actually telling you the type. And it is really nice to have them side by side, something I haven't quite seen in other books. Here you're getting some symbol function and, and how you can be using the symbol function in order to, <laughs> to add two numbers. So, so he's doing a functional call on the symbol function of the quoted symbol plus in order to add a couple of numbers. So this is a somewhat convoluted example showing you also here with apply. But the idea is that here you get a bit of fancy how fun call, how apply, how symbol function and things like that can be combined in order to get more complex operations out of Lisp. 
Now, here the author is guiding you a little bit through a somewhat confusing chapter on recursion, though the examples are not actually bad. And what you're getting here is a warning about improper or insufficient stopping conditions. That is that you may have a function which under some conditions will terminate just correctly, but will not work in other conditions. And here you see one which will work for odd numbers, but not for even numbers. So that's a caveat which you normally don't read. But the, the trap in the recursive programming lies in not choosing proper stopping conditions that is something which is not quite so clearly mentioned elsewhere. Now, you're getting, of course, further examples for recursion. Here you're having an example how to compute the length of a list. I think that's nicely shown. You have a clear stopping condition on an empty list with a length of zero. You see how the length should be added into if you're having a somewhat longer list and following this is a nice functional definition. So for somebody who is not quite firm in writing recursive functions, this is of course nice. But things do get um, quite fancy later on because, you know, this is just an introduction into recursion and the author goes on into showing you here, for instance, a general functional evaluator of finding the maximum number according to a function which you are supposed to name while calling this maximum function so that, uh, you know, <laughs> the sorting is undertaken properly and, and you get the result that you would be expecting. But, but this combination of a recursion with fun call and so on, uh, that's fancy. That's not bad. Similarly, uh, you do get a little bit of an introduction into optional and so on arguments, right? But what is also quite interesting is, yeah, then you're having also a little bit of a local function definition. So, so this is a little chaotic. It starts with optional arguments, just like I showed you here. And then it goes on to talking about uh, labels and, and local function definition. Until then, it continues, this time with keyword arguments. And what is interesting, mixes here, keyword arguments and optional arguments. So you get here a couple of examples, which many other introductory books sort of avoid because they might be puzzling perchance when you are getting your fresh first view of Lisp. Whereas here, you know, you're just being plunged into the cold water. But examples are, I believe, fine. For instance, this one with the rest arguments, in particular, the last example, um, very good examples, yeah, that you see what happens when you can, you know, get a couple of, um, get a couple of numbers into the list individually and then get the rest as one listed bag. So that's actually a very nice demo of the rest argument. And similarly, you are having quite fancy demos of map car and other such functions. So you do get here an idea of, you see like for instance, this one with the, is it a number one and isn't even and so on of map car. The issue though, somewhat here, is that um, he doesn't really show you any of the other mapping functions like that. It's like map car and good luck with map car. I mean, truly spoken map car is also the most useful of the mapping functions. But one might also say, I mean, come on, you've got a number of them. You, you can show at least map list, you know, just, just to see, just to see the contrast. Then you are getting a really confusing introduction into uh, lexical closures. But towards its end, the confusion is being simply set off by even further conclusion, uh, confusion because here you are seeing how to define functions which return lexical closures and <laughs> how you can be setting uh, here, G5, a symbol to a closure, and how you can then use map car in order to map it across a list. And I sincerely tell you, 
I have never seen anyone quite do such stuff in any other uh, Lisp introduction or Lisp book. Like everyone else is behaving similar, uh, civilized, except for this one, who is really showing you the weirdest stuff, which is, however, also quite fan fanciful and good for expanding one's Lisp understanding. Such as here, a general quick sort function that will quick sort some sort of list according to some sort of comparator function that you will need to give as you are calling the quick sort. Again, I have seen Lisp books show quick sort, but showing it in such a generalized way with a fun call to the user supplied function for the sorting, that's a first. And <laughs> it is fun, of course. Now, you're also getting a quick crash course on multiple value bind, again, with lots of examples. And yeah, he also in, in, he notes also here the similarities between multiple value bind and let, and is showing you here indeed two functions which are working in a very similar way. Just the one time he's just using uh, let, and in the other multiple value bind, which in reality also shows you that multiple value bind can be considered a little bit, you know, superfluous. I at least do consider it that way. And then you're going towards the do loop. Multiple value list, you do not get a taste of, sorry. <laughs> now, this is an example of a do loop, of, of do loop, okay? So that's what you get, punk, that's it. Hope you enjoy it, hope you grasp it. But you know, maybe it is expected that you are a programmer. So if you are though, then this is not really wasting your time and you're getting into the action quite quickly. Yes, it is a nice example. And it does show again with print of all print functions, how one can uh, set up a fundamentally simple loop. There you have a somewhat longer one, but as is common for this book, it operates rather through examples than through explanations. And again, out we are from that, and we're talking briefly about uh, character code conversions and a little bit of string and printing and operations here, you're getting a quick crash course and introduction to format. And you're learning how you can coerce things and turn symbols into, into lists and uh, uh, how you can get strings to, to become uh, lists and of characters and so on, as well as, yeah, here you're having symbol to string, as well as the string to symbol operation, which is happening through intern. So this is quite, quite quick, full of examples, and you do get a fast idea of how to do things that way. Also, similarly, you are thrown into file operations. Here you can see how to input a file and correspondingly, you're also shown how to write to a file with output. And yes, it's again, the print function, <laughs> but, but you have good examples. It's not, you know, one of those endlessly long winded meandering through, throughout unwind protect and whatnot. You're just seeing a simple with open file and, and that's it. Then comes a little bit of a macro chapter which would be quite puzzling again if you are not knowing anything about Lisp, but in fact, the examples are not so bad. He does show you the use of back quote. He does show you these evaluations, which a macro is allowing here. Actually, let me see, is it shown in this previous one? Yeah, you are shown the classical way of like, oh, not classical, it's actually the simpler way of just doing macros with quotes. And then you're showing the back quote and comma notation and, and the at sign uh, so as to make macros, in fact, not just easier to write, but in particular, easier to read. 
What he then, however, does is show you that you can also use this notation in D fun. Now that I see only in this book. Everybody else is showing this notation only in terms of macros. This author is showing it also in terms of lists. So that's fun. Delayed, <laughs> yeah, I know. Delayed evaluations, I also shown you here, car and CDR and cutter, how you can do delayed <laughs> evaluation <laughs> with the help of macros. Now that's actually interesting because uh, normally this is called lazy evaluation and is one of the hallmarks of Haskell. And the idea here is generally speaking to um, avoid computing a function until it becomes specifically necessary for some case or value. The av advantage of lazy evaluation therefore is that you can have um, functions which potentially would work on infinite uh, input, it just so happens that nothing is being evaluated until you reach a relevant point. So, so infinities can be easier handled through lazy evaluation because you, you don't actually jump into the infinite, you wait until it becomes necessary. You do not get any of these elucidations here though, it's just showing you how to do uh, delayed uh, car and cutter. Now, he does show you though, how you can be generating HTML code. Interestingly though, he doesn't really do that through macros as some other books are doing, but he does that just simply through function generation. And he does show you simply how to make websites. Also, you get to see 2D computer graphics and plotting as well as 3D graphics, as you can see here, uh, rotating lisp um, sign. Then maybe you can call that um, domain specific languages. He's also showing you how to create a postscript translator, a sort of system which is creating postscript code and how stacks are working. You know, this isn't really that much of a stack, it's just a particular use of stack in order to implement reverse Polish notation. But he doesn't really talk of it in these terms, he just, yeah, names it a stack. <laughs> Finally here, quite towards the end of the book, you also suddenly get to see ek, but you do not understand really what that means. Ek compares two objects and returns true when they are the same. The same what? Well, when they point, when the pointers of the two objects point to the same location in memory, that's when two objects are ek. And the difference between ek and echel would be that echel should also work on numbers, which in many Lisp implementations may or may not be ek, and in past decades and in past Lisps were ek within a certain range and not outside of it. So that would have been nice to mention here, though it doesn't really quite happen. And he also shows, yeah, how to use <laughs> one's um, postscript generation in order to write nice fonts and, and print things. Finally, you're going to see also how to do a little bit of binary computation. You know, just these are sort of exercises like you would see in other books. So how you could be, you know, inverting, uh, adding and, and so on binary numbers. Yeah. So this is actually nice. And then the final example, which he's giving you concerns data compression. So we're talking here really of zip files in example concerns data compression. We're talking here zip files and you are being guided through a session on how to compress text. And zip compression indeed is the final chapter. With this unaccessible introduction to common lisp and functional programming by Shinno Yamada has been reviewed. I do hope you enjoyed it. You see it is a bit of a wild ride, but well worth having. And with this, I hope to greet you here soon again as regular viewers. Until then, I wish you a wonderful time. And from me, 
good night and goodbye.